Gambling on the Future That you are a peculiar, very peculiar specimen of the feminine race, you are yourself aware. They called her wayward, wondering, deluded. She didn't argue, she seemed not to care. The woman brushed aside her veil with a swift gesture of habit, and, as though responding to Sigmund Freud, said, There is at least some amusement in being so curious a riddle. She didn't have a name to call her own, but she did have many avatars. Ada Augusta King, Countess of Lovelace. Ada Lovelace, nay Byron. A.A.L., the first programmer. She is also Ada, the language of the United States military machine. She is the Queen of Engines, the Enchantress of Number. Soon after Ada's birth, Lord Byron went his own opiated way, and Lady Byron brought her daughter up with all the excesses of stringent discipline to which well-bred girls were supposed to be subject. After rumours of a scandalous affair, she married William, a man in his thirties, when she was still in her teens, and became Ada King in 1835. Three years later, when William inherited his father's title, she became a countess in name as well as deed. When she married, her mother instructed her to bid adieu to your old companion Ada Byron with all her peculiarities, caprices and self-seeking, determined that as A.K. you will live for others. She tried to be the dutiful daughter and did her best to lead a domesticated life. She was the mother of two boys and a girl by the age of 24, but it wasn't long before she was describing her children as irksome duties and nothing more. Although she had wished for heirs, she had never desired a child, and described herself as having a total deficiency in all natural love of children. She wrote, To tell the honest truth, I feel the children much more nuisance than pleasure, and cannot help remembering that I am not naturally or originally fond of children. She wrote of her husband with affection, describing him as my chosen pet, but also expressed her indifference to any mortal husband, even her own. No man would suit me, she wrote, though some might be a shade or two less personally repugnant to me than others. One of Ada's most long-standing and trustworthy friends was the acclaimed mathematician Mary Somerville, who had published the Connection of the Physical Sciences in the early 1830s. Just after her marriage, she wrote to Mary, I now read mathematics every day and am occupied on trigonometry and in preliminaries to cubic and biquadratic equations. So you see that matrimony has by no means lessened my taste for these pursuits, nor my determination to carry them on. She also gained many new interests after her children were born. She lost thousands at the races, and, seduced by her mathematical prowess and her reassurances that she really did have a system, many of her male companions were also encouraged to do the same. This was an illegitimate use of her already dubious interest in mathematics. The passions suffer no less by this gaming fever than the understandings and the imagination, what vivid unnatural hope and fear, joy and anger, sorrow and discontent burst out all at once upon a roll of the dice, a turn of the card, a run of the shining gurneys. Who can consider without indignation that all those womanly affections, which should have been consecrated to children and husband, are thus vilely prostituted and thrown away? I cannot but be grieved when I see the gambling lady fretting and bleeding inwardly from such evil and unworthy obsessions, when I behold the face of an angel agitated by the heart of a fury. Ada was ill for much of her short life, walking with crutches until the age of seventeen, and endlessly subject to the fits, swellings, faints, asthmatic attacks, and paralyses which were supposed to characterise hysteria. Heaven knows what intense suffering and agony I have gone through, and how mad and how reckless and desperate I have felt at times, she wrote. There has been no end to the manias and whims I have been subject to, and which nothing but the most resolute determination on my part could have mastered. Like many of her ailing contemporaries, Ada had been subjected to a variety of treatments before she developed an 
opium system in the 1840s. This was supposed to bring her down, but it only added to her volatility. No more laudanum has been taken as yet, she wrote at one point, but I doubt another 24 hours going over without. I am beginning to be excited, and my eyes burn again. She would, she wrote, take laudanum, not forever, but as a regular thing, once or twice a week. The drug had a remarkable effect on my eyes, seeming to free them and to make them open and cool. In opium lay the vast expanses, orders and harmonies conjured by mathematics. It makes me feel so philosophical, she wrote, and so takes off all fretting eagerness and anxieties. It appears to harmonize the whole constitution, to make each function act in a just proportion, with judgment, discretion, moderation. Her doctor seems to think it is not a mere palliative, but has a far more radical effect. Since this last dose, I am inclined to think so myself. It is a pity that instead of ordering claret some months ago, he had not advised laudanum or morphine. I think he has got the thing at last. In 1851, a uterine examination revealed a very deep and extensive ulceration of the womb, which her doctor thought must have been the cause of much derangement of health. She died in 1852 at the age of 36. They called her complex of diseases hysteria, a diagnosis and a term which indicated wayward reproductive organs. Hysteria is derived from the Greek word hystera and means wandering womb. There was a time when it was widely believed that the womb, though it be so strictly attached to the parts we have described that it may not change place, yet often changes position and makes curious and, so to speak, petulant movements in the woman's body. These movements are various, to wit, ascending, descending, convulsive, vagrant, prolapsed. The womb rises to the liver, spleen, diaphragm, stomach, breast, heart, lung, gullet and head. Although such direct connections with the womb had fallen out of medical favour by the end of the 19th century, hysteria continued to be associated with notions of a wandering womb. There is in my nervous system, wrote Ada, such utter want of all ballast and steadiness that I cannot regard my life or powers as other than precarious. They said she was a nervous system, apparently unable to settle down. She had what she described as a mass of useless and irritating power of expression which longs to have full scope in active manifestation, such as neither the ordinary active pursuits or duties of life nor the literary line of expression can give vent to. She couldn't concentrate, flitting between obsessions, restless, searching. At one point she declared, There is no pleasure in way of exercise equal to that of feeling one's horse flying under one. It is even better than waltzing. At another, the harp was her greatest love. I play four and five hours generally, and never less than three. I am never tired at the end of it. Drama was another contender. Clearly the only one which directs my hysteria from all its mischievous and irritating channels. But even this was a short-lived love. I never want to look at the excellence of mere representation being satisfactory to me as an ultimate goal or exclusive object. Ada was hunting for something that would do more than represent an existing world, something that would work, something new, something else. Even the doctors agreed that she needed peculiar and artificial excitements as a matter of safety even for life and happiness. Such stimulations simply did not exist. She had to engineer them to suit herself. Hysterics were said to have a hungry look about them. Like all loose irrigares women, what they desire is precisely nothing, and at the same time everything. Always something more and something else besides that one, sexual organ, for example, that you give them, a tribute to them. Something which involves a different economy more than anything else, one that upsets the linearity of a project, undermines the goal object of a desire, diffuses the polarization towards a single pleasure, disconcerts fidelity to a single discourse. Ada was by turns sociable and reclusive, cautious and reckless, 
swinging between megalomaniac delight in her own brilliance and terrible losses of self-esteem. There had been times when she had almost given into the fashionable belief that overexertion of the intellect lay at the root of her hysteria. At one point she wrote, Many causes have contributed to produce the past derangements, and I shall in future avoid them. One ingredient, but only one among many, has been too much mathematics. Not even countesses were supposed to count. But Ada could be very determined, proud of her own staying power, and sometimes absolutely convinced of her mathematical, musical, and experimental genius. I am proceeding on a track quite peculiar and my own, she wrote. I mean to do what I mean to do. In 1834, she explained that nothing but very close and intense application to subjects of a scientific nature now seems at all to keep my imagination from running wild or to stop up the void which seems to be left in my mind from a want of excitement. And in spite of the prevailing opinion that numbers were bad for her, she was never coaxed into dropping the thread of science, mathematics, etc., these may still be my ultimate vocation. <laughs>